Hey there, this is Alana. You're listening to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm here with Jamie. How's it going? It's going. How are you? Good. We got to have a face to face last week. That was super fun. I know that for was for all so of like cool. an hour, <laughs> but I'm it really an, glad it worked out. It was a very good hour. <laughs> <laughs> it was you can pack a lot into an hour when you uh when you're determined and on a time budget. <laughs> and we got proof. So you actually took a picture. Yes. I don't have a copy of it, but you did take a oh, picture. Oh, I didn't send you a copy. Got, I'll do that. You might have. I don't think you did though, but you know, we documented that we were That's together. Right. There have been times when we've gone an entire weekend of being together and like, didn't nothing to show for it. But you know, like you said, it means that you're in the moment. And that's I know. Yeah. Like I actually make it a point to be like, I don't want to collect photographs of my life. Do you know what I mean? Like I, Mm -hmm. I would rather just be there happy and so involved in the moment. I'm not thinking about taking a picture for later. (laughs) Yeah. Agreed. But it was great to see you. Yeah. Good to see you too. Yeah. So today we are covering a coffee break question that has, I know Jamie, it's come up between just you and me before too. So I'm really excited to dive into this and basically like, is there ever a time to pray a curse or, or even like to pray for something bad, right? Like, especially, um, you know, if we're talking about the most evil people in the world, uh, terrible dictators or, you know, um, serial child harmers. Like, is it ever okay to say, dear God, I wish something terrible would happen to this person. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to it. I don't (laughs) like most things. We're probably going to come away with an interesting discussion and no, uh, absolute answers. And (laughs) that, that seems to be the way these things go, but I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's pray. God, Let's we, do just, it. we just thank you for this time to talk about this kind of different question and just kind of a, um, a difficult issue, a difficult question that a lot of people have discussed and maybe not had resolution about. We just pray that we would be able to look to scripture, that we'd be able to just be sensitive to your leading and have a conversation that would bless people and just help them understand just a little bit better um, how to process feelings when we're feeling angry about people and situations and and how to express that through prayer in a biblical way. And we just pray your blessing over this time and that you'd be glorified in it. Amen. Amen. Well, our verse of the day is an example of what people might come to know as imprecatory prayer or prayer over your enemies. This is from Psalm 109 verses six through 10. Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty, and may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. Which really, you know, is not Hallmark card material for sure. No, but it's in the Bible, not. and we can't ignore it. And so it's mm-hmm. you know, one of the reasons people ask should we pray this way? Is it okay? I mean, Mm -hmm. this is, I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming I haven't researched it. I'm assuming this is David, maybe, um, Psalm 109. I'm not sure, but it sure sounds like him. (laughs) And, um, you know, the, the big question is, can we do this before we do that though? We have a just for fun in this, like, you know, super not fun topic. (laughs) That's right. Well, um, before we get to the just for fun, I have a story. So when I was in labor with my firstborn, I had Psalms on index cards and my friend who was there, um, I don't know, like, I mean, obviously Scott was there, but she was there too, you know, for support. And so she was reading through these Psalms and she got to one. It's the one that ends with like, the darkness is my closest friend. So it's like, everybody's deserted me. I'm totally abandoned by God in the world. And the darkness is my closest friend. And I just saw in her face, like, well, this is weird. And then like it was a long enough labor that she got through that batch of index cards and just like recycle them. And then at one point I saw her flip the card, look at it. And just like, before even reading it, just putting it behind, just like, this probably isn't a, <laughs> this isn't what we want to introduce a little newborn into the world. <laughs> Imagine if that's the first Bible we see here. That is so funny, but it does bring up this issue of like, sometimes we kind of feel like we need to censor 
not that in that situation, no, I get it. Yeah, but mm-hmm. we feel kind of like we need to censor some of the stuff or explain it away or yeah. make excuses. Well, that was then this is now, but mm-hmm. I think it's in there for a reason and, you know, definitely. Yeah. But that, that is a funny story that you're going through the Psalms <laughs> and you get to, eh. yeah. Maybe not right. the best. So uplifting. just for fun, I'm going to do the one we have, but it also, uh, you reading the verse of the day reminded me of one that the kids and I do. So it's how can you come up? Like, what's the worst curse that you can give to somebody that actually will not cause any type of lasting harm, but just like be a major annoyance. So we'll come up with oh, like, that's so good. I hope that every time they're wearing socks in the house, they step in a pile of dog drool or (laughs) do you know what I mean? Like, I hope every time that they wake up in the morning, they realize that their phone wasn't actually charging overnight. (laughs) Yeah. Or every time you just start to drift off to sleep, someone in a different time zone dings you with a text. That's right. That's right. Or I hope that every time they get to the climax of a movie or TV show, their streaming service buffers for 10 minutes before they get to see what happens. Or every time they get to like a, an exciting part where you know for a movie no no okay this is better every time they go into a movie theater to see a long-awaited film someone gives them a spoiler oh can I actually tell a bad. funny story can I tell you uh-huh. kind of a funny but not funny story so one of my children who will not be named was little and went in to see I think it was Star Wars The Force Awakens and they, uh, my husband took him, it was just, just the boys, actually, just the two boys that went with my husband, Matt took one of them or both of them into the bathroom and the little one was (laughs) in the stall. Uh And this was after they had seen the movie, or maybe it was in between the movie. I don't Uh remember. I think it was Uh after the movie. Cause I think the new people were coming in to see the movie later. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't say the actual spoiler, right? Or should For I which just say, movie? How long has it been? Force out? Awakens. This was years oh. and years ago. Okay. <laughs> if people are worried about spoilers, they would have seen it by now. <laughs> okay. If you have not seen Star Wars, The Force Awakens, you need to not listen after this. So they're in the stall and Matt's pretty sure that there were people coming in for the next showing oh, based no. on the reaction after this. But oh, no. my little tiny little toddler practically is like, wasn't that super sad when Han Solo died? Oh no. I mean, for those of you that don't know, that was a huge spoiler just to even have Han Solo in the movie. And then there's this scene and he gets killed. And I, he might've even said, wasn't it really sad when Kylo Ren killed? Oh Solo? no. So it was a spoiler, <laughs> but we, we joke about that all the time. And Matt said he came out and he had looks from people that made uh-huh. him think that they, yeah. No, we're stuff. really, especially with the Marvel movies, because we're always there on day one or day two. We're right? so excited about it. And like we're Scott and I are really strict with kids, like not a word yeah. till we're in the car. We should yeah. have had yep. this discussion <laughs> before. Oh well, um, I got this book once just because I loved the title. It's it's something to the effect of if you don't have anything nice to say, say it in Yiddish. And it's all of these like Yiddish um, curses, but they're kind of along the same lines of what we were doing. Like nothing actually nothing malicious. Yeah. Yeah. So I just pulled up, I just Googled Yiddish insults. Um, Let's see. All problems I have in my heart should go to his head. Uh, He should drink too much castor oil. Oh, (laughs) that was terrible. That would be a good one. Let's see. Throw salt in his eyes, pepper in his nose. That's a little oh, okay. That could hurt. That could hurt. <laughs> a cramp in his body. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Not um, anywhere in particular, just somewhere in his body. Exactly. Anywhere. Any cramp. Um, let's see. Let me find one more. Oh no. He should get the, and then you name your town. So, like if I was really mad at you, I'd be like, you should get the Anchorage hernia. <laughs> <laughs> anchorage hernia the anchorage hernia okay. i actually don't wish the anchorage hernia on you i hear it's pretty terrible <laughs> thank you i would not like that hernia I, all right I so our that. actual just for fun question that we had in here is can you think of there was a time when there was someone who didn't like you or you didn't get along with but later you ended up becoming friends yes 
<laughs> yes, Good story. I, I loved it. Great story. <laughs> that was real Let's touching. <laughs> no, I remember one of my favorite ones is when I w- I remember being in elementary school and I know I had other friends, but for some reason I, I wasn't playing with them. It was early elementary school. And I went over to the swings and there was this girl that I was always really afraid of. She was bigger than the other girls she just looked really tough and she just kind of intimidated me Mm -hmm, and she mm -hmm. was kind of loud and like seemed bossy. Mm -hmm. But I remember going over to the swing set and like sitting down next to her and swinging. Oh, I know why I was afraid of her. One time I was in the bathroom in the hallway and I didn't lock the door all the way. And Mm -hmm. she actually opened the door like to go in Mm -hmm. for some reason that made me super scared of her too was just like oh my gosh she walked in on me in the bathroom she didn't mean to do it but I was just I was a really and often like you get so startled you don't even have time to see who you're looking at you know what I mean it's not as though you just stand there staring oh Jamie yeah but she was this girl and then I was kind of embarrassed you know but yeah anyway all these things but I went over and I kind of tentatively sat down next to her on the swings Uh and she became like a really good friend it was fun it was like you know Know, just she wasn't one of my best friends in fact mm-hmm. I don't remember her name but I just remember having a really good time yeah. with her and being like she's not scary she uh-huh. kind of loud and maybe a little bossy but she's really yeah. fun and I had a good time with her so yeah it just that was one of my first lessons and don't judge a book by its cover mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. first e- encounters yeah I remember in high school it was kind of my default if I just got like weird vibes you know like I was I was pretty nice I was I kind of like I think in high school because I was younger than everybody and shorter than everybody I think I had the reputation of just kind of being everybody's little sister right. so I, like I never really felt like I belonged but I also like you know didn't have issues with like oh you know we can't stand her but if I ever did get that sense from somebody my go-to was just to try to be like out of my way, nice to them to, Mm -hmm. you know, like, so if somebody had the wrong impression and they thought that I was stuck up or, you know, or whatever, I, I kind of made it my point to go out of my way. Um, I don't think I take the trouble to do that anymore. I don't know what that says about me now, but yeah. So I could think of, um, yeah, several times where there was some that I just kind of thought, yeah, they don't like me. And instead of being like, I don't know what your problem is, I would just, yeah, try to go out of my way to be friendly and win them over that way, win them with kindness. Yeah, no, I can relate to that. Just wanting mm-hmm. to, uh, I don't know, almost like, I don't, I, there's an unsettled feeling that I get when someone doesn't like me or when I perceive mm-hmm. they don't like me mm-hmm. and I want to make mm-hmm. it right. But yeah. I think probably your progression past that means that you're more confident in yourself and a little bit more like, yeah. I don't you don't like me to sound... prove anything. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I the goal of my life isn't to make everybody like me. Yeah. You know? No, I think but... that's a positive thing. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about these. Um, in the theological world, we kind of call this an imprecatory prayer. Um, definition is basically, yeah, praying curses on people. I mean, I don't feel like there's a way for us to really mince words <laughs> about it or make it sound nicer than it is. An imprecatory prayer is just like the verse of the day we read send somebody to oppose my enemy, send somebody to accuse him, send somebody to find him guilty. Um, May his days be few. Like the psalmist is praying for God to end this person's life. Mm -hmm. Um, How do we feel about that? There are a lot of layers to that. Um, I think my first thought when I come into it is what is the context and does it still apply to me today based Mm -hmm. on the new covenant and, Mm -hmm. you know, based on Jesus. And so the first thing that I think about that Jesus said is love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Mm Now he doesn't say what to pray, but I'm assuming (laughs) this is nice. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It's my second fiddler on the roof reference in a couple episodes, but they they're asking, so they're all in this Russian village. And one of them asks the rabbi, is there a proper blessing for the czar? (laughs) Do you know it? Do you know what he says? His blessing for the czar is may God bless and keep the czar far away from us. Yeah, exactly. It's like, (laughs) yeah, started off with, yeah, yeah. God bless and keep this person. (laughs) May Uh, he get the Anatevka hernia. (laughs) Right. That's exactly right. So you know, I know it's love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. You know, it has been said before Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, death for death, whatever, for whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, I do know that we do have this command from Jesus, um, but I, I don't feel like I'm at the place where I would just say that there's no room for expressing your deep disappointment and grief over something that someone's done or, you know, um, anger towards mm-hmm. someone. Um, mm-hmm. But as far as taking it to the point of praying for their death, my next question is, wouldn't praying for their salvation and their restoration be more effective? I don't know. And so I, I'm not sure. Those are, those are the mm-hmm. like, you know, kind of New Testament thoughts that I have when I think I of, of yeah. the message of Jesus. I mm-hmm. think that, um, that, that those are kind of, that's kind of the tension I feel. But I think that like, if you have someone that you would consider an enemy, I don't think God wants you to be bound by hatred. I don't think he wants you to be bound by just being tangled up with um, negative emotion about a person. So to me, like if I had to give the like quick answer, which I don't think there is one, I think that number one, we should not err on the side of painting a happy picture of it, of I'm just going to love this person. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking Mm -hmm. of the woman who found out that her child has been abused by someone Mm -hmm. and that person and yeah, I'm you're not, not going to snap your fingers no. and, oh, God bless them. Yeah, Right. Or the person who, you know, uh, is suffering under leadership of a tyrant ruler, yeah. who's, you know, mm-hmm. committing genocide. Mm-hmm. Those kinds of things. I really feel like, um, I feel like you can't just paint a happy face on it. I think honesty is the number one important thing to remember in our prayer lives. So the Mm -hmm. way I read this, like the way I read this Psalm personally in light of Jesus and, and the love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you is this is David being just raw and honest with God about how he's feeling. And although go ahead just play, I don't know, is devil's advocate an okay enough term? Is that kosher for our we podcast? Can say that. We can say that on this um, podcast. Everybody knows. I think I'm, I'm in total agreement that if you are in despair, you shouldn't gloss it over in your prayers. Like if you read through all the Psalms, they cover every single human emotion in its most extreme form. And I think that that shows us that when we have extreme emotions, positive or negative, it is very good to take that to God in prayer. But here's, here's the one caveat there. I think there's a difference between saying, God, I am so mad at this person that I wish they were dead. I am so mad at this person. I don't think I can ever forgive them versus saying, send this person to hell and may they never like, do you know what I mean? Oh, there, absolutely. I, I there, there is, is a difference. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I think when we're talking about praying through your own personal pain or anger, I would say, yeah, let's be as authentic as we can and not feel like we need to come to God with our Sunday best. But there is still that part of me that like, I think that I think there is a big line between telling God, I'm so mad. I would, I, I want to see this person dead Mm -hmm. as a mom, somebody, something horrible happens to your kids. I can see that being a natural reaction that you can take to God in prayer. I do see that being different though, than praying, God, please let this happen or make this happen to that person. No, I can totally see that. Yeah. So we do have, you know, we have both, we have the Psalms being so full of all of the emotions and giving us freedom to take all of our garbage to God. But then we also have like the new Testament did change a lot and the cross changed a lot. And so, you know, now we have the love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. So I don't know. I mean, I can totally relate to the person who is angry enough that they would want to pray for somebody get sent to hell. I'm still not. And I, I think it's totally fine to admit to God. I am so mad at this person. I would love to see them burn for eternity. Do I think that it's healthy for them to stay at that place for decades? No. I mean, hopefully there will become a healing and a softening, but when it's that raw and that I can see that being our human reaction, I'm still not sure that it's therefore, yeah, let's just go ahead and pray for these terrible things. I also wonder 
Do you see a difference between imprecatory prayers prayed against somebody in your personal life versus someone like a political figure? I, I see the difference being, I mean, I don't think there's a difference in terms of human life. I mean, that person is just as much a human as the person that you know off the street or your best friend or your family member that's wronged you. Um, I could see a difference. I definitely, I think there, there, that it's the same in terms of if you're praying for someone to go to hell, if you're praying for someone to die, um, for their family to suffer. Um, I, I just, I, I see that there's, there's no difference in the humanity there. It's not like you're praying for this idea. You're praying mm -hmm. against a person to die period. But I, I do see where the difference is, is this person is in a position of authority in which they could, you know, whereas this personal acquaintance mm -hmm. or friend or family yeah. member has wronged you, this could be a person like my first thought is Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the whole, you know, assassination attempt on Hitler. The yeah, Christian. tell us about him because not everybody knows his story, but so, I think this is a great example. All right. So I have not brushed up on this. All I know, and you can help me if mm -hmm. I mess up, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, uh, he wrote the book. Oh my goodness. The cost of discipleship. Is yep, that it? Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, the cost of discipleship, devout Christian. Um, but he saw what Hitler was doing and he became part of what I believe was a Christian group of people who planned, or, or at least he was a Christian who planned an assassination attempt on Hitler mm -hmm, to get mm -hmm. rid of him to, you know, yeah. basically in their minds, be the instrument to get yeah. this godless man out of office. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there were people I'm certain who prayed that it would succeed and who yeah. prayed, you know, for the death of this person that I think most people, it would be the first person that would come to mind of evil ruler. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you've got that kind of thing where you're trying to accomplish something that will create a better, greater good in the long mm -hmm. run. Mm -hmm. So in terms of our discussion, it wouldn't be going out and doing that. We're talking about praying these things, praying that this effort would succeed, participating mm -hmm. in it even. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, that, that would be kind of the idea yeah. behind stopping atrocity. Yeah. For me, I think it gets, I think for me where I fall it, in the question of, is it ever okay to pray an imprecatory prayer? My thought is um, it's definitely okay if you're feeling that amount of anger to admit that anger to God. But I think that I see a, a fairly big distinction between praying curses on someone in your own life and somebody like Hitler. And the difference I see is like, I can despise Hitler and everything he stood for without having bitterness in my heart. Cause he never like personally harmed me today. Do you get what I'm saying? And so it's almost like that, um, the difference between like murder and manslaughter, right? Is there, is there malice in your heart? I think I could conceive of an imprecatory prayer. I don't think that you could, I don't think you could pray curses on somebody who has personally wronged you that you're angry at and not have that malice in your heart. I do think I can, at least on the theoretical, I can conceive of a time when you would be praying for gods to stop a madman dictator and to do so without hatred for him, but just with um, like despising what they stand for and praying for God to stop them, whether that means they get killed, assassinated, saved, like whatever that means. So I, I would not go so far as to say that I think any time praying an imprecatory prayer is sinful. I think a huge part of it is what's in your heart. Um, and again, like, so I'm thinking if it's somebody who's removed from you and you're not living in bitterness and hatred toward this person, I could at least on the theoretical say, God, please stop this horrible person from doing what they're doing. However, it needs to happen. Make one of their 
generals despise them and kill them, make one of their closest advisors poison them, make him die of a heart attack. I'm not going to go so far as to say I'm convinced that that's an okay prayer, but I can at least entertain the thought that, yeah, like I think about things in recent history and I think about certain people that I am concerned about becoming even more and more tyrannical. And I do sometimes pray and ask God to stop them. And I, I kind of leave the decision of how to stop them <laughs> up to God. But then again, like, I don't know, do I think that it would be okay for, you know, Christians to start praying for the president to die because they don't agree with their politics? No, I don't really agree with that either. So it's yeah. murky, but I think on the theoretical, yeah, like let's let's all say that we are Christians in 1930 uh, Germany, and we have the foresight to understand exactly who Hitler is. Like not everybody understood that um, when he was rising to power, but let's say we did. I can conceive of a time where a Christian could pray for God to stop Hitler. Um, if you knew that there were assassination attempts, I could even see praying for those to succeed, guarding your heart from malice, right? So we're still not hating him, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure how possible it is to do that without the malice. So it's mm -hmm. a big, I don't know. No, I, <laughs> I don't totally think it would it. be appropriate for somebody in your own life. I just, I don't see, I think prayers for them to be brought to justice. I think that's huge. Um, and I mean, God is so, <laughs> he's so into justice. <laughs> he, um, you know, like when you read the old Testament and the prophets, like the two biggest things that people get in trouble for idolatry is number one, injustice is number two. So I think absolutely. Like if you know that somebody, um, you know, is on trial for a horrible crime and there's a chance that they're going to get off on a technicality. I think praying for them to be exposed, for their sins to be exposed. I think all of that's righteous and good. Um, when we get though to, and I hope that they die a slow and painful death, then we, we are risking crossing over into bitterness and hatred. Yeah. And I, I want to make sure to go on record as saying that I recounted that story, and if I wasn't clear that I do not advocate vigilante action to stop things for a greater good, that's not, I'm not going to go on record saying that, yeah, that's fine, just take things into your own hands. If that wasn't clear, I want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> but when, what you're talking about with the, you know, I think that's, that's the key, what's in your heart, and mm -hmm. what David mm -hmm. did not know was that Jesus died on the cross to take yeah. on the sin of mankind and mm -hmm. to pay the penalty. He was not given, I mean, he was, he was ashamed of the things that he had done to sin against God. He knew what those mm -hmm. things were, mm -hmm. but he wasn't aware of the extent of the sacrifice of Jesus. He did not have the Holy spirit living in him. Mm -hmm. And he didn't understand the power of the Holy spirit to transform people's lives. No matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Paul, Paul could have been one of those people that right Christians of the time could have yeah could have prayed it for please, please help God. him to just drop down dead help him to drop mm -hmm. dead and look yeah. what God did with him and it's not to say that those people whose loved ones and who they themselves were persecuted by Paul right you know didn't have a right to be angry and it, that it wasn't mm -hmm. a righteous anger because it was God's people were being persecuted mm -hmm. so I think what you said is just very important is a as Christians, remember, where is your heart? Um, and maybe to redirect that, like, let's think of creative ways to make this person suffer and then ask God to do them instead of that, to pray, mm -hmm. God, bring justice, thy kingdom come, yes. thy will be done. And I feel in my heart, like when I think of the things that make me angry, mm -hmm. like I can feel that same release of that anger, that same, like placing that in God's hands that I could, if I asked for mm -hmm. specific, you know, torture or yeah. whatever, without no, the it. icky feeling of, of getting like spiraling into, I feel yeah. like asking for those specific bad things to happen to a person 
stokes that bitterness rather it than can, yeah. gets rid than of it. to release so, it. Yeah. Yeah. To, to release to kind it. Of evict it. Hands. Hmm. Yeah. I, don't yeah, know. I mean, it is really thought. interesting. I had such a unique dream. Do you ever, have you ever had like a Holy spirit? Um, sometimes in my dreams, like I feel like the Holy spirit is, um, maybe it's because my brain is, isn't filtered. <laughs> So like I'll talk to people in my dream with so much more like Holy Spirit power than I do in real life. Does that ever, do you have anything like that ever? Like yeah. every so often I have dreams where I'm just like, I am an on fire evangelist and I'm just, you know, like Jesus is right there. So I had this dream once that this guy had like kidnapped all of my children. And I think he was like, I forget exactly how it was, but basically I was confronting him. And in, in real life, I'm very timid, <laughs> but in my dream, I was, I was like a Holy spirit girl confident. And I was like, I was, um, fire and brimstone <laughs> preacher girl. <laughs> and I was like, and, and God has said that it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea than to hurt even one of these little ones. And you've got three of his little ones. And, but then like, as I'm going on and on, like, like I said, I am just on Holy spirit fire, like preaching at this guy about how, if he harms my children, he is going to suffer so much the wrath of God. <laughs> but then <laughs> In my dream, I'm still talking to this guy. And then I say, but then again, if you ask forgiveness for God, he's going to grant it to you. And I don't really know how I feel about that. (laughs) That was was the end of my dream. Like it was very (laughs) anticlimactic. It was like all of these very powerful things. And then, but Uh you know what? But that's how it is. I really, I feel like in real life, that is how it is. There's this either and this or there's this absolute truth that, you know, Mm -hmm. there are people that have done things that deserve punishment. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you ask forgiveness, anyone, even the absolute worst sinner in the whole Mm -hmm. world Mm -hmm. can be made right with God. And yeah, it's a tough pill to swallow. And I don't want anyone to think that we think that it's easy because Mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely not an excuse. I know I've heard some atheists kind of complain because taken to its extreme, um, it kind of is licensed to do whatever. And then just as long as you ask God and say, sorry, God, then, then you're totally fine. Um, I think I loved your idea of just praying for justice because that can basically go two ways. Like, let's take this guy in my dream. (laughs) If I were to pray for justice for him, that either means that he does experience a horrific wrath of God and that scares him into letting my children go <laughs> or justice can also be the salvation that we we get when we do accept God's forgiveness. That's another form of justice right through the cross. Mm-hmm. So I almost feel like that's a great place to start. Um, I think I think there are things like if you're if you're a decades old Christian, and there's nothing in the world that makes you angry. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that you're um, focused enough. <laughs> Maybe yeah. this is this is too big of a blanket statement, but basically, like a Christian who is aware of what's going on in the world and who wants to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I think we should get riled up about certain things, and those certain things that anger can fuel our prayers. And I don't want anybody like I grew up basically like, and I'm going to almost guess that maybe you did too, Jamie, since we're both, um, we have such a hard time and there's conflict around us, but like anger was, was a, uh, a scary thing and anger was a no, no. And, um, the epitome of righteousness, not even from a religious standpoint was like, just never get angry. And, really like there are certain things like anger can give so much fuel. Like I can't, I can't over exaggerate how full of the Holy spirit I was in my dream. Like just going on at this guy and like a billion times more confident than I am in real life. And it was the anger that fueled that. I think that righteous anger can fuel our prayers in certain areas. I'm picturing this more in terms of the kind of global and political stuff it's I think it is harder when we're talking about interpersonal relationships you know like your husband cheats on you and leaves you I don't know that it's it's best to you know 
<laughs> pray for for him to go and drop dead. I think probably better to admit your anger to God and ask him to heal your own hurts in your own heart. But when we're talking, especially on this geopolitical level, like the fact that there are so many children being sold into slavery, sorry, that should get us all not just sad, it should get us angry. And yeah. I, I do feel, I sometimes go back to like, especially if I'm praying against injustices against children, I kind of go back to that mama bear that got called out in me in my dream. Mm -hmm. And I will put that into my prayers. And I guess in a way, it's almost <laughs> God, you either better like give them their dramatic come to Jesus moment, or I don't know, is it ever okay to rejoice in knowing that somebody is being punished for their sins? That's another. That's another hard one. Let's say that you, your your children are murdered and that person gets um, executed for it and there's no sign of any kind of repentance. Is it okay to rejoice that justice was done? Yeah, that's a hard one because on one hand, I feel like God is just, he values justice. And so yeah. to say, justice was done. Mm -hmm. This is good. And calling that good. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but then on the other hand, I think about the, uh, is it the, the unmerciful servant who basically, right. like, yep. do we fully grasp what How we've our been own sins are yeah. forgiven? That's a really good point. Excited to see someone else. Like I've heard you're right. People just be like, Oh, Lord Jesus, come. And I'm just like, oh, wow. Like, I mean, yes, I want Jesus to come, mm -hmm. but it's almost like Jesus come and punish and these saps. That I know. Just, just yeah. So awful. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, You're right. I, if we I take don't that, know. Yeah. If I we take like that too harsh. harsh yeah. It I've, is. But you know, and done I don't. So much. That's a I'm really not, good point. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel, but to rejoice in justice. And again, when something so big has happened, I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think it's wrong to rejoice in justice being done, but the flip side of that is, am I understanding that all have sinned and fall short? Exactly. I don't know that I completely really grasp that, that mm -hmm. the sins that I've committed are yeah putting me in the same category with sins that I would be like, Oh Lord, punish exactly. that. You know, I don't right. think I do fully grasp that's, that all the time. I think that's a really sobering reminder yeah. for sure. I wonder if maybe even, um, imprecatory prayers against the evil and against the darkness, I think, um, maybe more so than against the individual. I think that could be another way to look at it. Right. Um, that's a great point. We can come up against, what is it? Um, you know, our struggles, not against flesh and blood. Right. Our enemy is not this one political person or this one individual who hurt us. Our enemy is the devil and all of his minions who are wreaking havoc on the world and trying to steal and kill and destroy all of God's children. So maybe even, um, I think, I think imprecatory prayers against uh, demons, right? Like, I think that kind of thing. I know um, what does, um, at one point Jesus is casting out demons and doesn't he actually tell them like, go back, basically like go back to hell kind of thing, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that so? I don't know. We've talked in so many, <laughs> so many circles. I would say a huge takeaway is, um, don't just try to ignore anger and say, oh, this is a bad feeling. I need to move past it to be righteous and guard your heart against hatred and bitterness. I'd say those are probably, if there are any takeaways, because, you know, Jamie and I always um, have a really hard time coming down with absolutes in cases like this, because we just don't know. Right. Um, but in this case, yeah, don't, don't be afraid afraid to feel angry. Don't feel guilty if an injustice is happening in the world or has been done to you. And that leaves you feeling angry. Like that's, that's a sign that your justice meter works. Right. But yeah. also as you pray, I think it is important to guard our hearts against malicious anger. 
And so maybe a litmus test is if you are actively praying against someone or something, what's your motivation? Is it just to see somebody punished? In which case it probably falls into, you know, that goes against the spirit of the gospel of praying for those who persecute you and blessing those who, you know, blessing your enemies. If it's more though, I'm praying against this person because they stand for something so evil, right? I don't know. I could see there perhaps being a way to pray against that without it leading toward malice. But lots of asterisks there because because I, I think it is kind of dangerous murky water. I I would um I would wants to, I don't know if I would, being a people pleaser, I would want to get up and leave if I were at a church service and somebody was praying an imprecatory prayer against like a one of our national leaders or something like that. Like I I don't feel like that's appropriate in any form <laughs> at all. Yeah. But but then again, you're like, okay, well what if um you know, I mean there are dictators alive today that are as bad or worse as Hitler. Is it okay for us to pray against them? Oh my personal heart, sometimes I do. And I like to think that that's fueled by a sense of justice, right? And not out of malice, but I also recognize, no, that's, that's not how I would want someone to pray for me. Yeah. Interesting. And I think another, I think one other way, just kind of a litmus test for if you're praying in a way that's good and, and glorifying to God and edifying to you is mm -hmm. how do you feel when you come away? Like, yeah. do you feel unburdened? Do you feel like it's in God's hands and he is powerful? And do you feel hope or do mm -hmm. you feel bitter and angry and just, you know, that's I think not always going to happen. Obviously there are things that right. are just very painful, but right. if you feel yourself stoking the fires of hatred mm -hmm. that may not mm -hmm. be a good prayer that you're praying if that makes yeah. sense yeah no it is a hard one on a somewhat related note do you ever feel like let's take away um we're not talking about terrible dictators we're not talking about people who have really really hurt us it's just in general do you feel like it's ever okay to pray for the death of somebody so I've I'm done thinking it. I've yeah, done it before. Yeah. Um, like, you know, somebody no, at the end like of life, really death? suffering. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've had multiple people in my life that I've just, that I've prayed for that. I, yeah. I knew where they were going and mm -hmm. I just prayed for a merciful quick death. Yeah. I've had people ask for that. You know, we had a friend who went into hospice and knew she only had a short amount of time and her family was all like, I think everybody except for one grandkid or something was going to be visiting that weekend. And that was her prayer. It's like, I want to make it to the weekend. I want to see everybody. And then I want to go as peacefully Jesus. as I can yeah. immediately <laughs> after that. And, and so, yeah, we were kind of praying for that. I can totally get some people not being okay going there. And I would say this, if that doesn't feel appropriate to you, you know, you certainly don't have to, but I, I've been in that same case too. a believer at the end of life, who's suffering a lot and they're, they're ready to go home. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, sometimes I have beseeched God on their behalf to make it sooner and less painful. And I, I don't feel, I don't feel bad about that. You know, I almost feel like, um, you know, I told you about my experience. I forget if I've, put it on the podcast. So, but kind of praying for my grandpa the night that he passed, yeah. you know, I was just woken up in the middle of the night and, and led to pray for him. And he had gone into hospice. So we knew it was coming soon. So, um, but I, I really felt, um, almost like the equivalent of a doula, right? Like I felt like my prayers were helping escort his spirit. And, and for some people that might sound too kind of out there and not, you know, I'm not going to, past judgment, good or bad, but that that's kind of the sense I got, like really my job was to ask God to lead him from this world into the next in a way that was peaceful and, um, just a, a welcome and, and joyful homecoming. And, and it was really a privilege, you know, like I would have, um, if I had been given the option 
to do that and be awake all night praying for that, or just to wake up and know that he had passed sleep peacefully, <laughs> I'd much rather have been able to kind of be involved in that. It was a really, really special um, and unique experience. So yeah, I, I don't feel bad about that, but again, could that get taken too far? Yeah, probably like <laughs> someone's mad at their spouse. Should they just pray that they have a heart attack? No. <laughs> um, and then, I mean, imagine the the guilt you would feel if something did happen <laughs> to them, you know, and that's another thing. So I guess in, in that case, you know, we just need to remember that God's sovereign over when we, you know, when our time is, you're not going to be able to pray for or against that to change. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, if, if somebody's like death date, whether they're saved or not is October 12th, like, and you do or don't pray for that, like that's not going to, um, I don't know, I'm kind of rambling, but basically like there's a sense that, yeah, we we trust in God's sovereignty as well. I really like thinking about it in terms of, you know, we've talked about how the Holy Spirit interprets our prayers. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe like, maybe we every so often do pray an imprecatory prayer <laughs> and God kind of interprets that. So you know, when I'm down in the basement, punching a punching bag, getting really worked up, praying against a tyrant, which I've done, um, maybe like I'm praying that God would stop this person. However, like, God, I don't care, but I'll give you some ideas of how you could stop this person. But maybe the Holy Spirit recognizes that the prayer behind the prayer is for the wickedness that this person is perpetuating to come to an end, hmm. right? So I might be saying, well, God, or you could have, you know, this person turn on him, or you could have it be a cancer. Like I'm giving God all these ideas of how he could stop this horrible, horrible person. And maybe like in, in the just realm of how God interprets our prayers, maybe what he's hearing is please stop the evil that this man is perpetuating from continuing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I mean, it all boils down to prayer, not being a formula. It's, it's your relationship mm -hmm. with God. And if you've prayed imprecatory prayers, you're not condemned. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> if mm -hmm. there's stuff in your heart and you're getting it out to God, um, do it, get it out there, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. know, make sure you're doing it in a way and learning along the way and, and right. kind of having these discussions and these thoughts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. going to scripture and finding examples and, you know, just, just making sure that your goal is God focused and mm -hmm. not, not always you focused, you know? And yeah. Well, and it's been a long time since we've talked about like generational sins on the podcast, but mm -hmm. I could even say like, do a quick inventory. Like I could see somebody coming out of a voodoo background or something and be like, I'm not even going to touch this. <laughs> right. You know, like certain, um, certain things in your background, I think could make this more murky water for you. Right. If, if your spiritual background, even if we're talking a few generations back is something like voodoo, where it really is about using prayer and kind of spiritual forces to harm others, maybe, mm -hmm. Maybe this is too close to that, that you just stay completely away. Whereas, you know, if that's not part of your, your makeup and a struggle, maybe it's a little more, okay. Like for example, I know, um, my dad never would go into like a Buddhist temple, even like as a tourist or something, because on our Japanese side of the family, that's there in the background and, and he feels more sensitive to it. Like it, you know, he kind of feels an oppression in his spirit about that. Whereas like I can walk into, not that I have, but like I could see myself walking into a, um, oh, I don't know, like a, like a tourist destination. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not there. It's not something that I, you know, have personally struggled with it and not feeling that. So I think mm -hmm. some of it too, is just, yeah, having a little bit of discernment, um, Jamie, you and I are people who, if we were to fall on an extreme, it would be the extreme of not getting angry enough, <laughs> in which case maybe like every so often bringing the spirit of an imprecatory prayer, especially if it's being prayed against like evil itself and not an individual, of evil. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. that can give fuel to our prayers. If you, if you know that you're 
biggest struggle and temptation is to be way predisposed to being really, really, really ragefully, aggressively angry, then maybe your focus is going to be more on prayers of love for, for everybody, right? So I would say this is another example. Like, yeah, just kind of know your own bent, know where you kind of fall on these extremes and use some wisdom and common sense in that as well. That's great. I think that's a great kind of summing it up. I think it's it it boils down to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and know mm-hmm. yourself and mm-hmm. yeah, good. Yeah. And yeah, let's not forget that it's always so important to pray for salvation for people, whether we in our hearts hate them or not. Obviously, it's better if you don't hate them, <laughs> but if you do, like you got to start somewhere. Um, and yeah, just remembering to pray for their salvation as well. <laughs> it always does remind me of me with those dreams. And if you ask God to forgive us, ask God for forgiveness, he's going to forgive you. And I kind of wish you wouldn't, because I would rather see you punished because you're hurting my kids. I'm glad that was a dream and not real life. Uh, anyway, if you have questions that you would want to see covered or topics for us to discuss on a coffee break episode, you could send this to us at prayingchristianwomen.com slash questions. We really love hearing from you. And are you ready, Jamie? Should we close with our blessing and benediction? Yes. yes All right. May God right. preserve you on the day of temptation and give you full victory over sin. May no transgression have dominion over you, for he who is faithful will give you a way out of temptation that you may stand up under it. Sin shall not be your master so that you obey its evil desires. Instead, may the spirit who gives us life set you free from the passions and desires that wage war against your soul, for you are not under law, but under grace. And our benediction is from Revelation 1, 5 to 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.